Good evening. Hey, everybody. This is Dennis Kelly speaking from Tiki Deeks Lounge in New Jersey, and it's my pleasure to present tonight uh, a special event with Mr. Ho, leader of the Orchestratica, Brian O'Neill, my old friend who was going to be leading us through uh, his latest transcription of Esquivel big band recordings, this one of Johnson Rag from Infinity and in Sound Volume 1, I believe, right, Brian? Uh, you're asking the wrong guy. I just do the music part. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to it just earlier this evening. But uh, anyway, I've uh, seen some of what Brian's been working on, and it's really cool. So I'm really looking forward, to, uh, as I'm sure all of you are, to. Now, I want to make sure that um, just everybody who's participating tonight understands some of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be taking uh, questions for Brian in the chat room. Uh, what I'd like to ask, if I may, uh, is that we are going to uh, have everyone's microphones, everyone's individual microphones muted. Uh, and what we'll do is, if you would be kind enough to, in the chat, you'll see you can choose who's going to be the recipient of your uh, chat message. Please choose me, Dennis Kelly, and uh, I will jot down your name and the fact that you have a question that you'd like to be posed to Brian. And then every, every oh, 10 minutes or so, whatever feels right. We'll take a look. Hey, hey, we have some, uh, some uh, questions for you. And uh, then at that time, when we identify you, you can unmute your mic and you'll be on your way. So without any further ado, let's bounce it over to Mr. Ho. All right. Thank you, Dennis. How's, uh, how's everybody doing out there? Um, in the chat, um, I'm always curious where people are, are from and where you guys are based. I know we had someone from Turkey, someone from Mexico, Scotland logging in. So drop, drop a message in the chat if you feel like it. Let us know where you're coming from today. Um, Esquivel's music is uh, definitely out of this world. Um, it's in this world too. We got Chicago in the house with Eric. Sweet. Illinois, LA, of course. Uh, Esquivel hotbed there. Uh, Oregon. Okay. Exotic Rhode Island. Oh, John Miner, what's up? Green Bay, all right. Lots of Americanos here. We have some Mexicanos here. We've got New York, Istanbul, there it is, Alexandria, sweet. New Jersey, Portland, great, awesome. Well, yeah, Esquivel's music definitely like went all over the place. Uh, it, 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 it spread and uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about the kind of the backstory of, of the band and just where all this stuff started. Uh, and then we're gonna jump into um, some uh, I'm going to uh, try to demonstrate the transcription process for you a little bit uh, using a new tune. Um, again, Dennis said we're going to do some Q&A. Please feel free to interrupt uh, Dennis anytime. We don't want to like do questions at the end. I'd like this to be interactive and we'd like to invite you to come on the screen and actually uh, verbally ask your question if you like. You don't have to do it that way if you don't want to. Um, glad we have a bunch of Boston in the house. I I'm, I'm, I'm in the area. Um, so what's what's this all about right <clears throat> um back in 2004 um i was playing in another group called waitiki and uh i was uh hanging out with a friend uh over thanksgiving break and i was up in Keene, new hampshire actually and uh, i was looking at a record store just you know chilling out and looking at records you know and actually actually cds at the time and uh in the used bin in the exotica section while i was looking for old exotica records uh, I found uh, more of Other Worlds, Other Sounds by this guy, and, and you could open the CDs and play anything in the store. Uh, and that was like my first uh, introduction to Juan Garcia Esquivel's music. I never heard of this guy before. I, I was not like, I didn't, just no idea. I didn't know anything about kind of mid-century, you know, space age pop music, easy listening, all this kind of stuff. And generally speaking, I'm not like an expert. I'm not an expert in like Esquivel or the period. I, I don't listen to a ton of the period's music. Um, but there was something about his particular art and, and, and arranging mastery that I thought was just genius. Uh, this, this word's used a lot in Spanish when we talk about Esquivel, actually, and um, very polarizing musically. I, I, when I had the idea to rent his charts, that was the plan, was like, you know, I called the band up and say, hey, we should cram a bunch of people into the, you know, Lizard Lounge here in Boston at our next quartet show and just like do a set of Esquivel's music kind of for fun. It's kind of zany and crazy and it, it would kind of just be a fun little project so that kind of spinned into this whole thing where i realized oh crap there is <laughs> there are no charts and so 
under, it's just like this onion started to be peeled back. So a friend of mine named Sean, who played in another band, said, oh, Esquivel, you have to meet Brother Cleve. So Brother Cleve lives here in Boston. He's a big kind of tiki cocktail expert guy. And he also knew Esquivel. He played in Combustible Edison for a while. And he had actually become pen pals with Esquivel. And so my friend Sean connected us, said, you guys just need to meet each other if you really want to do like an Esquivel live project. So we went to this bar called the Independent in Somerville, uh, Somerville, New, not New Jersey, and Massachusetts. And we drank sidecars all night. And he like gave me all the backstory on Juan Garcia Esquivel, like personal stories, what happened to the music, why no one can play it anymore, that there, there had been previous attempts to, uh, you know, I, I think it was Merkin Hall in New York City had wanted to do an independently produced concert of Esquivel's music. And the, the big challenge was there were none of these things. Uh, these manuscripts here, obviously the band needs something to read or else there's not much of a concert uh, unless you're playing John Cage, which by the way, there was a John Cage four minutes and 33 second Zoom uh, performance the other night. I thought that was so awesome. So anyhow, if you guys don't know uh, four minutes and 33 seconds by uh, John Cage, it's a, he was a, a very radical uh, contemporary music composer in the 50s and uh, the piece is uh, a pianist usually walks out on the stage and he sits down at the bench and he puts the music up there and then he sits and there's no playing of the piano for four minutes and 33 seconds. And then he takes a bow and, or she and they leave the stage. And the point was, was it was all the ambience of the audience and the, the sounds around you, which was the point of the music. Now it's hard to do it because everyone's in on, in on the joke. It's not really innovative anymore, but I thought it was fun that they celebrated that. Anyhow, we're not talking about John Cage today. We're talking about Juan Garcia Esquivel, both Johns though. So anyhow, um, long story short, I mean, there's so many details here and I don't want to, I don't know how much everyone wants to know about all this stuff, but like Cleve and I got talking and, you know, I tried to track down some publishers that might've had the music and try to figure out what happened. And like others before me, uh, Cleve, uh, we just can't find these charts. And the, the story that I understand it was um, in the 70s, Esquivel was in Vegas. And, um, you know, at the time, the, the corporations were coming in, the mob had left, the budgets go down, the band sizes would get reduced. Uh, and basically, a lot of his material, like his, uh, from what I hear, a lot of his personal belongings, some of his awards, all of his scores and manuscripts. And you got to imagine, like, there's a lot of paper for every track. If you've got 30 people in an orchestra times every number of arrangements, it's just a lot of paper at the time. There's no computers, obviously, uh, no personal computers at least. Uh, and so as we understand it, he went back, to, he moved back to Mexico in the 70s to get work. Uh, and he left his storage unit in, in Vegas and he left it unpaid. And they just threw all the stuff out or they burned it or the story just goes, they just basically tossed it because the bills went unpaid. So that was, that's how I understand what happened to all of this stuff, which is really valuable to musicians because it, it, it means his music can't live anywhere except on these recordings. So I was still hooked. I mean, partly because when I heard the story, it's like, all right, now it's a challenge. Like, <laughs> bring it on, you know? <laughs> I was really stoked to like try it out because I, I, I like, I didn't do it. I hadn't done a ton of transcribing before. Uh, and so I started out, you know, the, the first, the first tune I did was Andalusia. It was the first song I heard. It's the first song on the album. And it was just like, so ridiculously over. It's just ridiculous. The, the whole tune, I was just like, this is crazy. Like the trumpet parts are like unbelievably like high. And I was just, it, it just like hooked me for some reason there. Um, and so that was the first piece that I did. And I still have some of the original this isn't right. I mean, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, you know, I got like 10, 10 of the instruments here. You know, I, I can kind of show it to you. It's just I, taking a guess at what's going on here. I remember being on the floor at Boston's Logan Airport, like when I was just hooked on this. I was traveling on the airplane. I'm like ruler and pencil, and I, I'm just literally re rewinding two seconds of music constantly and trying to dig into what's going on there. It's a very intimate. It's a very intimate process, actually. It's just like you're getting in someone's side, someone inside someone's head. Um, so this didn't work very well. Like at some point, this just doesn't scale. Like I, I do like doing some of the pencil. Uh, the, the the pencil and paper has some of its benefits. It's it's actually really fast for like. Um, 
being able to jump between parts really quickly, like, oh, I heard a squeak here. There's a little, vi a little you know, xylophone thing. I can just go write it in. Digital tools sometimes get in the way of uh, the, the ability to move quickly. Uh, but I've gotten much faster at the, the notation program I use, which I'm going to show you, which is called Finale. It's kind of, the, it's a piece of shit software, to be totally honest with you. It's been around for 30 years, and it's kind of the industry standard for notation software. Um, and I'm so invested in it at this point. I, I just, it's too expensive to like switch to something else and rebuild the charts. And, and part of the point of this is like, um, these charts, I, I'm going to show you some of the, um, the charts here. I'm going to, let me share my screen here. Um, and I, I, I'm, when I go into this, Dennis, I'm going to lose the chat. So just feel free to bump in and interrupt me if there's any questions in there. Again, feel free to ask stuff along the way here. Cause we want this to be, uh, interactive as much as possible. So, um, all right, so <clears throat> close all this boring stuff. So I'm going to pop open finale here. Okay, um, so let's pull up like, here's frenesy. I was looking at that earlier. This is what a finished track looks like here. Um, it sounds, I'm going to have to zoom in here. Let's see. I don't actually write it in this mode. I write it in this kind of left, just infinite left to right scrolling mode here. Um, I kind of wanted to show you what a finished one looks looks like uh, before. It looks like a ton of, it is a ton of, it is a ton of work. I tend to look at this as like a puzzle. It's just like kind of building a puzzle and uh, you know, left to right is the notes, you know, for each instrument and going, you know, each staff is a different instrument there. Um, so part of the reason, again, I do this digitally is because all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's one bar of harp in this song. Great. That's going to cost me another $2,000. I need to add a harp staff now. I can't go back to my paper score and insert a harp. I mean, if there's space left over, you can. This kind of stuff started driving me nuts using the pencil and paper. So the digital tool mm -hmm. finale is a little mm -hmm. bit better for this. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this, so this is, uh, this is frenesy. And I typically work, you know, I work different ways. I tend to work horizontally. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take one instrument and, and sometimes go all the way across, um, usually doing the wins last. I, I, I often start with the, the easy stuff. Uh, for me, the, the hardest parts of these tunes are the, uh, the wind parts, especially what we call a shout chorus in big band music. It's usually when the whole band comes in and it's like the big loud brass stuff. There's so many people playing at the same time. It's very hard to figure out exactly what's going on there. Um, so I could show you kind of like just what this silly playback sounds like. The playback is also just so you know, the computer can play it back. It's, it's not 100% accurate. I mean, even like steel guitar, you know, there's like darn, you know, all this kind of like Esquivel stuff. There's no finale patch for, for like Esquivel steel guitar, you know? <laughs> so you just, you know, you have to get used to how it sounds here. And, 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 and then I go and revise. In fact, I'll show you one of the things I do quite often. If you, if you look up here at the title, you're going to see, you're going to see all these dates up here on the charts. So I revised drums on August 4th, 2014. And then I, I added B3, Hammond B3 stop notation. So if you know the Hammond organ has all those different buttons and the valves and all these things, well, that is a huge amount of control over the sound of the organ. The organ is not just on and off. It's like a, it's an analog instrument and you can totally sound horribly wrong if you don't have the stops right. And, and so I actually learned this. I went over to Rusty's house. Rusty uh, Scott is a wonderful jazz pianist in town and plays ham, a great Hammond player. And we literally went through every tune and we like tried to figure out what the stop notation was. And we went back and added it into the part. So if I ever had a sub or someone come into the band that hadn't worked it before, they would know what settings to dial in so that it actually sounds correct. Um, so the point here is this is kind of a living project. And when I hear mistakes in a part, I come in and I just make a note here because what happens is you end up with all these copies of the music and you don't know which is the latest version of stuff. And it, it became a nightmare for the, for every time I'd have a concert, you know, who's reading which version of the chart and stuff. So that's like how I've kind of done it. And it kind of is just a nice reminder of, I can't believe that's like 10 years. Wow. That's almost 10 years ago. Trumpet one update. 
uh, voice pitches, piano cleanup. You know, there's all kinds of stuff here, but let's see what this sounds like. It's gonna sound terrible. Oops, actually, you're probably not hearing anything. Uh, one second, I don't think I shared my screen uh, properly with computer sound. Let's try that again. Okay, uh, so let's go to the front. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna play something. We were hearing that, that was fun. Oh, you were, okay, good. Yeah. Um, yep. let, me, let me see if I can figure out iTunes. Terrible software as well. They screwed it up. Good, Fred, good luck. <laughs> I'm still Fred, trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's a pain. I love how, so I'm searching for Frenesy and it brings up three results and I have all these recordings of it. Wow. Um, funny, here's like, wow, that's like the original Waitiki one from March 4th, the day before my birthday, 05. That was probably the first time we ever played it. Here's, you know, anyhow, but there's more, here they are. Okay, so here's the original, original Frenesy. I'm hoping we don't get this problem. This is a good time to get your cocktails out. You have them. Show me your cocktail in the video. Here's to check out my. Yes. Does everyone have their Escadel stir? Oh, yeah. Oh, I see a tiki bar. Look at that. Wave to me in the tiki bar. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You're looking at the camera. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So this is Frenesy, right? So now listen to our version and see if you hear differences. This is our recording, the unforgettable sounds of Esquivel, same tune. Listen to the cheesy computer playback, which I have to deal with when I'm transcribing one of these. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, I can't play the steel part. So this is a funny thing, like there's all this, so the lead trumpet is, is the first trumpet in the big band, it's called a lead, lead player. And uh, they typically have the highest notes in the big band. And this, is, this book is a very, very challenging lead book. So all these note heads, see these notes here that are orange? It means they're out of range. <laughs> it's like not for Esquivel, but like finale's, finale, it's, it's finale's way of telling the writer hey, your, com your composition is going a little bit outside of range. Uh, I think if they're still, I haven't used this in a while, but that's what it used to mean. It means you're, you're going outside of the instrument's natural range. So some of the notes, you know, I have to write for Esquivel because it's so off the charts. You know, literally like the ledger lines are really crazy high. Um, so yeah, so, so anyhow, I basically build these parts out. Um, I look at it as a puzzle. I like to work horizontally sometimes on one instrument. Sometimes I work vertically going down and it's a lot of, it's a, I'm gonna show you when we do, uh, so tonight I wanna work on Johnson Rag a little bit, um, which has just been on my list of to-dos for like 10 years. Um, but what I, so normally what I do is I take iTunes and I, I shrink it, if I can remember, they changed all this stuff. Um, how do I make it small? Let's see. I forget, I never, I don't usually use the, let's see. Oh yeah, I need my equalizer and I want mini player. Yes, okay. The reason I like this is because I, I want this playback thing to be as long as possible because it allows me to jump just a matter of seconds at a time. I could drop this in GarageBand or some other piece of software um, that has, uh, you know, ability to like loop a section um, but usually I, so I just like park this little window right above uh, the tune that I'm working on here. Um, and so the experience is like, so let's find this vocal part here. I'm listening to the voice down here. So actually, I'll show you where we are. So I'll, I'll point to where we are. So here's the top of the chart. Oh. It's always fun writing those uh, lyrics in. 
Is it Ow? Is it Pow? Is it Zow? <laughs> Ow! Two, three, four, seven. And I have my piano here. And then someone else is playing. So here's this my piano part. This is where I come in. I'm playing piano on this tune. So it's it's where I'm kind of flying along, I guess I didn't really show you what I meant to do. But when I'm first writing out a part, let's go back to the top here, this first chord. So I wrote down this chord here. So I'm looking at this bottom note here, the voice part, this first uh, first main measure here. And it's it's sitting listening to... come in here and I notate. What I also do sometimes is I cheat a little bit. Um, and by the way, there's software that can help with some of this stuff. I really wanted the challenge of doing it naturally to exercise my ear and just as a personal challenge, I didn't want to cheat. So like there's, I think there's a software called the amazing slow downer, <laughs> which I could really use for my life um, to have the amazing slow downer. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, what I do sometimes do here is I turn the EQs, I play with the EQ. So for example, I might cut all this bass frequency stuff out and kind of come into this vocal range and then trim everything out way high end. So this is, what I'm trying to do here is artificially boost the vocal track uh, just by changing the EQ a little bit. In fact, I, I might even like jack these up a little bit like this, and if you listen to it again, uh, here we go. The vocals, it'll, it's gonna sound very tinny now, because I've taken all of the low end out. Like even right there, there's a different, there's, there's a... all right, so another stop. I kind of hate going back to this because you start, I start finding mistakes and like notes I left out. It's like, I don't want to know <laughs> what's wrong with this again, you know, because it's just a, it's like a living, breathing thing. Every time I open these charts up, there's something missing, you know, like my biggest clam is there's a missing cowbell part. You guys want to hear the missing cowbell part? Okay, I'll tell you. Here it is. Here we go. This is really important to me. So music makers, great tune. Here's the original. Hold that thing. A newscaster thing, right? So if you listen, just listen to that little bit. There's two instruments. There's this, right? And there's a xylophone, which is kind of like the vibes behind me, except it's a wooden instrument. You guys probably know that. Listen to what's wrong with my version. Oh, where's the cowbell? Do you hear how this is missing? It's just a lonely little xylophone. Here's the right one. If you guys want refunds on this track, just let me know. I'd be happy to provide refunds to anyone that's unsatisfied with their recording. How come I can't? Hey, Brian? Yes. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, oh, yeah, jump in. Up. I had a couple from uh, Chris Santillo uh, was wondering, was there any tune that you really wanted to do, but you just found it too difficult to get your arms around? And also, uh, he was sort of had a similar question about 
some of the sounds, which you were talking about a little bit with the steel guitar, although you, you did a champ job on yeah. trying to use what you could in MIDI, which I know is so difficult yeah. in MIDI you know, instrument sounds. But sure. any things that were just like, oh, it's just too much to get your head around or? Sure, I, I can answer that. But, <laughs> Everything. <laughs> but no one wants more cowbell? Oh, must oh sorry. The dumb crash. If only I had a drum and a cymbal. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, every time I hear like these stacked brass parts and any of these tunes, it's like, oh, how am I going to like dig through all of that stuff? Um, those are generally the hardest parts. It's the, it's the shout choruses and things where everyone's playing together. So let's, let's pull up this Johnson Rag tune um, here. I'll just... I'm just going to scan through this. I, so just going into this session, by the way, I've tried not to listen to this tune. I've tried not to practice it because I want it to be fresh and show you what it's really like. So, so I can make a fool of myself. It's, it's going to be like watching paint dry me going through this, I think, but <laughs> I will try to make it entertaining. Um, but I'm just going to skip through this chart. And I'm going to tell you where I'm freaked out. Just listening. I'm going to turn the EQ off here. There's a lot of people playing in that little. So this is all easy because. Why is this easy? There's only about eight people playing. There's a lot of transparency in the parts. It's very clear. Now, wait for this. That's like full band kind of sound. So peeling back the onion of like how many players were there and yes you could go to the records and like cleave had a bunch of the discographies on who played on a lot of these sessions and and all this stuff um, we also have the practical reality of like i could transcribe it for all 30 people if that's what's on it but it's never gonna get played that way because it's too expensive it's already too it so expensive to tour this project which is why you know we don't do it live too often it's it's we we figured out a way to make this work with 22 musicians. Uh, so that, that, we figured that out with doubling. We have certain people that actually double. If you haven't seen the show live, like I'm not really a piano. I mean, I was, I studied piano. I'm not a pianist, uh, but the piano roles only needs to be played about half the time. So what we did is I'm a percussionist and drummer by training. We moved all the percussion to the front of the stage with, uh, in a square with the piano being one side of the square so that I can cover percussion parts, which there's tons of in his music and cover the piano. And so what happens is Rusty runs over from the organ to cover the piano whenever I'm playing percussion. And there's almost, there's very rarely any times where there's organ and piano and it's just kind of worked out. He's also Polish. And so he can play accordion, which is a great double. So really hard to find someone that plays accordion and Hammond organ <laughs> and great jazz piano. So, so we have, we found some people that have unique skill sets uh, for, for the music uh, for, for jumping around here. Um, the woodwind well, players uh, also. Brian, I was going to say um, Mel, <clears throat> one of our participants, Mel yeah. and Coley. Uh, oh, sweet. Who may know, uh, fill my pockets. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> he had a, he had a question and uh, Mel, why don't I just invite you to unmute your mic and you can ask the sure. question. Sure. Uh, I, I, have a, I also had a question about uh, Alvino Ray's great uh, pedal steel parts. I, I'm a trumpet player primarily, but I play a little pedal steel and uh, I, I just wondered how do you, how do you approach an instrument like that when you're trying to transcribe it? Uh, I can't, I've never even seen like music for pedal steel. I just played it by ear. So. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I can show you, uh, I'm happy to show you what the notation looks like. It's pretty, it's pretty funny. So, um, I, I jumped back in this view cause I wanted to see, actually, I just want to see all these awesome faces. Thank you guys for coming out to be totally honest with you. I'm shocked. So many people were actually interested in this because it feels like a totally nerdy musician kind of thing to like dig into this stuff. So, but part of the reason I like the orchestra fans are awesome because everyone's like really into like cool weird different stuff not regular stuff and it's like that that love of the tribe is like uh, my tiki crew and all those people that like cool weird stuff so i it's fun to get to come and share this with you because it's like most of this stuff just this is just like a personal thing that lives inside me and except when we go and tour it and play the cd so it's fun to get to share this with you um so yeah 
but I heard a great I heard a great quote one time, which was, and it, it makes me think of just what you were saying. Van Dyke Parks once said that music, the pursuit of musical excellence, is a really monastic pursuit. Mm -hmm. It can also be a wonderfully social thing. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. There, so, I, I, I guess we are. Yeah. So you know, it um, is. it's great. I love, it's so great that you're doing this. So yeah, carry on, sir. I will do there that. Are, there are more questions, so keep on going. <laughs> There's a meat seagull. What's up, man? Philip's got an awesome background. I need your background. So cool. I'll, I'm gonna hop back to my screen share. So what? Just so you know, when I'm, um, by the way, when Joshua Bell, I can see you look like you're in your tiki bar, like my wife saw that she's like Joshua Bell the violinist was on the last remotely music series session that is unbelievable I'm like hell yeah like uh-huh do you know the funniest little story about Joshua Bell when they put him out I think they put him in the subway uh and they in the uh, somewhere in New York at a station and he just put his hat out and he played violin and most people just walked right by you know this is a Joshua Bell's a very very famous violin soloist who makes lots of money playing with symphony orchestras and you put him outside and like everyone just kind of walked by. So I bet this Joshua Bell though is not like that. So, cause he's rocking the orchestratica shirt, which I love. So anyhow, jumping back to my screen share. Uh, how do I do that? I go to screen share and I go to, okay. Let's talk about, so yeah. So just to wrap up the previous question, generally it's not, a, I, I don't remember a specific tune I couldn't do. I do get scared away of uh, parts that um, have instruments we just don't have, like it's unrealistic to tour a harp, uh, especially when a harp plays two bars of music. Like there's, what's that song? Is it Snowflake or like the one that sounds like doo -doo -doo -dee -doo, like an old Western tune and it has like these little harp plucks and they're beautiful. It's just not practical to bring that instrument with us. So sometimes I will listen to something. I'm like, it's just got too many different things in it that we don't have. Local show, yeah, it's easy to kind of pull out the stops. Uh, but that's another factor in kind of choosing what rep we do. Uh, and, and I am partial to the big band repertoire as well. Um, we don't, I, I was kind of resistant to doing mini skirt and yayo and some of these tunes that Frankly, they just don't use all the people that I've hired to come play music with. And I like the big band sound. I like the 1959, 1960s kind of stuff. That is his arranging genius to me. I'm less interested in Esquivel as a composer. I mean, he, he definitely wrote some quirky stuff and it got placements and commercials and all this kind of stuff. But for me personally, it's, I, I've always enjoyed being, I was a big band drummer and I really like uh, the big brass sound and all that. So I skew. I skewed towards those, short, those charts, but we had enough fan, fan revolts if we don't play Mucha Muchacha and, <laughs> and uh, uh, mini skirt. So anyhow, so going to the next question. So you asked about steel guitar. So let's look at this. I'm gonna leave uh, the score view. This is called score view, which is everyone's part. And I'm gonna go um, to steel guitar. Where is it? Uh, slide guitar. What's a good tune with slide guitar in it? So basically, um, I don't even know if this is the most recent version. Let's see. Um, yeah, this is. This one's pretty, pretty basic for, for steel. Um, we did have to kind of come up with a notation and, and, and how to work this because most people that so most people that play the the steel guitar which is a thing where they put like a piece of plastic around the finger and the, the guitar uh is a horizontal down here and you pluck the strings. you see it in, in western country music stuff like that uh, most of those players don't read charts they don't get a piece of paper out you don't go to like the blues bar the western bar and see music stands on the stage too often so it's super weird to like have a music part like this uh, and luckily we've, we, we have, I have about three players in my state. I call it my stable and my stable of, uh, like people that I call to do this, this part. Um, my friend TJ down in Florida and Tim Obetz here and, and Tev who plays in the quintet actually, uh, hopped on this, uh, for one of our gigs in Mexico. Um, and I had to learn about part of this. It's fun. I get to learn about the instrument. So I, I learned about like what's called, uh, a six there's, a, there's these, different tunings that the steel guitar uses. And when I, so from low to high, how each open string is tuned, 
what note is like the default note. And there are these different tunings you can use, but there's some standard ones called like A6 tuning and C6 tuning. And when I learned about those tunings from like TJ, I think he and I spent, he actually rewrote and, and marked up my parts. And then what I do is I often will recollect the parts and then I'll take all their pencil and put it back into this part so that the next person that plays it has even more information in here uh, to work with. Um, and so when I learned about that tuning, it actually helped me figure out some of these crazy chords and stuff. Like he would tell me there's no way that that can't be right because I'm in this tuning and I would have to like, you know, have my foot up and like, there's just no way I could do that. So it's the notation's probably wrong. So user error, comp arranger transcriber error. So this is our notation. Um, I, I don't know if there's a, a, another, uh, Let's see here, uh, orchestratica. Um, I don't know how to get to that. Let's see. What's the guy, whoever asked the question, um, what, is there a particular tune you're interested in? I'm, I'm happy to show you. Uh, uh, Sorry, Brian, I don't, I don't have a specific tune. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. No, it's all right. I'm just uh, thinking about what tune here has steel guitar on it. Um, I loved hearing the stories about when they did the recording sessions and Juan would put the sheet music in front of the steel guitar player and he'd break into a cold sweat. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? I don't know that story. I, I had heard that story and um, it was in uh, Incredibly Strange Music, uh, the book. Uh, that oh, okay. A long interview with Esquivel, long interview with Esquivel. Um, but I'm not sure actually, I think, because I, I was asking Cleve about that in relation to your recording of Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Uh huh. And uh, Cleve told me that the steel guitar that was used, and I don't, I don't do pedal steel. I think it might have been a steel, steel guitar, but that it was a, a a modified guitar. It was a custom instrument, and so he could get that high octave gliss on the coda of Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Because I think when you did it, that was in a lower octave. And um, uh, okay. I was, I was, and I was like, oh, what's you know, was it? And he said, oh, you you know, you'd have to have the modified instrument to do that. Huh. But by the way, Boulevard of Broken Dreams on the uh, CD, which I assume everybody in this event has, probably. Uh, if you don't flash that cover, uh, Brian. <laughs> but um, I thought that was so awesome because it was the one track on the album where you expanded it to put in a solo, and it was just the most bitchin' trumpet solo. Like oh that. yeah. Yeah, that was a um, uh, Cuban uh, player in, in, in town. Yeah, Yaure, yeah, Yaure Muniz yeah, uh, played uh, lead on, on that. Yeah. A lot of people in uh, who are in the audience uh, had seen has seen have seen a lot of the uh, the big band shows, uh -huh. seen a lot of the Esquivel shows. Cool. as I did. I think I saw almost all almost all all of them that were in the East anyway. Cool, um, cool. So uh, yeah, so we all enjoyed that experience very much. But um, there was there were also a couple of other uh, sure, sure. questions. Jump in. Um, one was uh, uh, Brent Roman. Brent, you want to jump in? Uh, I think you had a question for Brian. And I know uh, Mauricio had one as well. Okay. Let's see. Brent, are you there? I want to see Brent. He may, uh, let's see. Did he or go we could or we could jump over to yeah jump uh, to the next one oh no, no there's, oh there's there he brent. is brent's unmuted here we go i can't hear you brent uh it, it says you're good it says you're not muted which is great um and i see drums oh here we are oh yes here we go. now i yes. can great sorry i had a stupid usb microphone plugged in in it I didn't no worries have... sorry about that um i wasn't expecting to talk so but anyway um yeah, I, so my question was, I would assume that transcribing tune after tune after tune, that you would sort of come to a sense of how Esquivel composed slash arranged so that theoretically, like what you were talking about the stacking of the chords, you know, the winds, these big hits, yeah. that are somewhat problematic to just mm -hmm. hear, right? Uh -huh. But then after sort of kind of figuring it out, do you have sort of do you become aware of a sense of how he tends to do things as opposed to like other composers and arrangers like Elfman has a style and other people have a style, but Esquivel has a very particular style. 
that after doing it a few times, can you kind of get a sense, oh, I think this is, this is how he's voicing it. And that helps. I, I know what you're saying. Um, because of the way I write the, um, I, I have that knowledge from a um, sound perspective, like I can hear that it's Esquivel now. Like I'm sure many of you can, you know, when you hear an Esquivel tune, you know, some of the licks, there's those chromatic runs and like really thin instrumentation. Then, wah, you know, this crazy, like full brass kind of sound. It's more on that level than it is, I think, on the arranging level. And I think partly because I'm not arranging the music. I'm just, un I'm just peeling it back. And I don't, I don't really review it like from a, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. I don't think about it as holistically because a lot of times it's like I'm working on like two trumpet parts and then like, oh, I'm just sick of this, like time to work on like percussion. <laughs> And I'm like out of the head of that. And then like I come, I forget about it, come back, get, get a clear brain, play the original, play the current one. Oh, it's thin. Something's missing. Okay, let's go back to the trumpet now. I've kind of lost a concept of like, how does he write for trumpet section? Like, it's so fragmented. Like, it doesn't, I don't get to carry any previous knowledge forward for the most part. It, I, I, and I'm not a woodwind, like I'm not a brass or wind arranger. I don't, I don't write I don't compose or like arrange for, you know, big band music. So I don't, I don't really have that. It's just more like a cheap copy. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I think the thing that strikes me, Brian, is, is hearing it because I know I, for my own production work and music work that when you're, it's, you get so deep into something, it takes so long for you to hear it in a way other than as a set of details. Yes. You yeah. Know? And, and it takes a lot, like you say, you have to go, play drums for a while and then come back to it. And, and then yeah. you can kind of get the whole picture and maybe hear what's missing, you know? Yeah. I think that's a fair, that's a fair read about how I feel uh, about it. It's just this like pile of detail that I'm trying to get all of it right. Like puzzle. And then, okay, it's right on to the next one or whatever. You know, you know so. related to that, there was someone who, uh, someone who had a question about uh, perhaps um, I think they referenced and I'm trying to find it once again. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Mauricio was uh, saying that he was wondering about uh, you know being the, having the band open to playing, for instance, you know Ray Conniff or Carl Jader, which of course leads us to talk about the the second uh, the, the small group. Album. Yes. Uh -huh. um, but uh, you know, so and he saw the band four times in New York City. So uh, oh, sweet. yes, I saw yeah. I saw with my with, with my dad actually. We are from El Salvador, and you were so kind, Brian, to sign the uh, a disc for my dad. I mean, it's not my dad; it's like my dad, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he yeah. owns uh, he owns. I, I believe we have this conversation. He owns a, a Salvadoran restaurant here in Queens, New York. Okay. And uh, he he extended the invitation to you to to be there some da someday, you know, let, let him know. Okay. And first of all, I would like to, to, to tell you, thank you very much for your music, because you. it's, uh, nowadays it's a kind of difficult to find somebody, somebody or someone or, or some or orchestra who is willing to play this beautiful, all these beautiful tunes in the way that they were, they were mainly at the beginning. Yeah. So that's yeah. the reason, that's the reason of my question. Are you, are you open maybe in the in the near future or in the future to play Conniff or to play Carl Jader? Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, well, thank you again, and, and please pass that along to your, I, I think I remembered this conversation about the restaurant and and uh, I thank you so much for, for coming in here. And, and uh, I'm always, uh, there's a lot of people uh, that I've met from Central America in this project in Mexico as well as your area. And they're always very, uh, very generous in their love for what we've done here. And it feels weird too. I just want to say, I mean, now that we're kind of talking about this, I feel pretty weird as a gringo coming in. Like when we go to Mexico, uh, you know, and present this music, we've done that three or four times now. It, it feels a little bit odd for me to do that. Um, or at least it did at first until I met some of the people and the fans, uh, especially in Mexico city uh, and felt felt the appreciation. A lot of it was stunned faces, actually, I think, to see largely a gringo orchestra come here and play Esquivel to them. But the thing that was really the most rewarding for that was the number of people that really didn't know about Esquivel in Mexico at the time, especially like in the, in the early 2000s, he hadn't really gone through the same revival that he did. You know, the, the lounge crowd kind of picked up Esquivel 
you know, in the nineties with the, there was a big lounge revival and I don't think that caught on in Mexico it, it, early it on with the kind of the hipster record collectors, you know, they kind of went and picked out all the vinyl early and it's gone, but just a lot of people didn't know about him. And I'm like, this is the coolest shit. Like, how do you guys not know about this guy? Like, it, and, and I think they felt that joy when we played the music that this is someone you guys should be celebrating. Like there's as my, you know, we have an agent down there and he's always like loves to try to get this group down there because he's like, there's more to Mexico than mariachi music. And I've played in a, another Mexican band, song music, jarocho music, wapangos and other kind of stuff. Uh, but this is also a very unique output from Mexico. And, and so thank you. I just wanted to, I don't know, a little tangent there, but I definitely feel the love with my, my, Latin, my, my Latino friends here. And we have some, some gente do Brasil. I know we have some, some uh, friends from Brazil. My friend Cristiano was moderating the Facebook uh, world. So hi to everyone on Facebook. Uh, Oi dos brasileiros. Um, anyhow, so thank you for your thing on your question. So, uh, I'm not, I'm not against playing, uh, you know, some other, you know, music, um, you know, my, my main interest with the, with the orchestra primarily, and this is partly just the practicality of touring these days with a very, very large expensive group. That's rather esoteric to most, uh, performing arts presenters you first, you have to kind of explain who Esquivel is if they don't know. It's either usually total delight if they know about him, or it's like, who's that? What is Space Age Pot? What is that? So first, you got to unpeel all of that and kind of explain to them about what this project is about. And so it's financially, it's just difficult um, these days. And and I think I read this book actually about like kind of the the death of the big band and and how much actually the mob had a lot to do with the rise of the big band because they funded the entertainment in Vegas. Uh, and a lot of it was about getting the best crowds in and you had to have the best entertainment. And so you could afford to program these really big orchestras uh, there. And I think this was the same thing down in Cuba at the time. And, uh, and so that when the corporations came in, it became about, you know, saving bottom dollar and all this kind of stuff. It wasn't, it's like, well, maybe we can do this five musicians, you know, and that's a lot how like today's music, even with Broadway, you know, I, I play in pits a lot around uh, the pit orchestras in Boston. Uh, and a lot of it's just about, you know, cutting costs and, and keeping the orchestra small. And, you know, even late, I think like, I just heard Phantom of the Opera is out on tour again until COVID, but <laughs> two keyboard players, the whole Phantom now is on two synthesizers. And it's, you know, you need sense in some shows and stuff, but, and I don't have a problem with the synthesizer, but that's kind of the reality of it is it's just when you want to, when you need professional musicians who can read all this music and do all this, it, it's just, it's, it's tough uh, financially. So that's the biggest driver of, of why I don't, you know, why we don't do as much touring with the large ensemble. We are always working on this with, you know, I spend a lot of time, you know, doing booking and sales and marketing and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and we, we do have conversations with presenters who have the facility and the ability to mount this kind of project. Um, and, and so there are conversations that are warm, but part of the reason we're doing remotely music series here uh, is the reality is just, as I'm sure many of you know, that are, you're passionate music fans. Uh, you know, we're, I just found out like, you know, all of my 2020 like theater work is, is, is done. Like it's all moved into 2021 already. And even that some of us feel like it's going to, it's, that's ambitious already because even in, even if you have a vaccine, the question is, are people going to feel comfortable going out to a hall with 300 or 3000 people in it until that problem is solved? The finances, you know, just with music, it's not a high money thing unless you're talking about really big pop music. The, the touring market is it's it's kind of been decimated right now and it's going to be this way for a while so um which is which is sad because i felt like there there's been more money coming into jazz and create what i call creative instrumental music um there were more grants coming up and and things were looking kind of up at least in the u.s there's a lot more funding for stuff in some of the other countries but um i i'm it may be a while before we get either of these groups out again just because of the reality of the touring situation you know, most of the presenters that I've been on many webinars and stuff right now, they're just like agents, artists just don't even call us. Like we're just dealing with the fallout of all the canceled tours, rebooking all the shows to the next season, which is already a catastrophe because there's deposits and people paid for visas and artists from out of the country. And it's just, the it, it just trickle. It's really trickle down when you kind of think about it. And so it's, it's like, what do we do now? And I'm like, 
remotely music. Like, I don't know. And so I'm glad you guys are here because we're trying to figure this out with you. And we can't just play either. You know, we can't, we can't play rhythmic music. And this is a, a hint for our next session, which is May 15th, remotely music series session three. We'll have the quintet back. And, and I think it was Matt Lynn. So, someone had, had written in from the fan, from our uh, mailing list and, and talked about just embrace the challenge of the latency of the internet. So for those of you are listening, it is not possible to play real time music with people uh, in another room. Like if you had a hard wire connection, you could do that, but not across the city or whatever, because there's delay. The signal has to go to Zoom and then it has to go back to the other person. And there's, you know, the people on Facebook, it's a 20 second delay the people on Zoom, there's probably just like a little, maybe a half second delay, but a half second delay in music is, you just, it wrecks any ability to play with someone else live. So when you see people playing live on Zoom, they're really playing along with the click track that was pre-recorded, uh, and then they just create a video with everyone playing along to the click, which is how most pop music is recorded anyways, but it's not the same, we don't do that. Um, it's not that we couldn't do it. And, and we may decide like, hey, let's, we, maybe we need to do, maybe we need to just start doing some stuff with click. Um, but it wouldn't be live. It would be pre-recorded unless we play music that doesn't rely so much on timekeeping and rhythm. And I'm a drummer and a percussionist. So like, what does that mean? Well, talk. it's like now we have to unwrap another new thing. And I'm trying to be positive right now about this as an artist. And a lot of my friends are just miserable and, and, and professional musicians, especially the sidemen and the people that don't, you know, like I, I, I work with a lot of different groups. I front the orchestratica. This is, you know, my baby, so to speak. Um, and I'm trying to look at this as like, you know, I'm a jazz musician in part and classical player in the, in the spirit of jazz it's about improvising. So what do we do with this set of changes? You know, we call chord, you know, the, you know, chord changes, but this is a new set of changes. It's not chords, it's just something else. So what do we improvise with this? And honestly, just when I had heard from you guys, the fans in different places, that's where the name Remotely Music came from. It's like, holy crap, like we should have done this a long time ago, like Alexandria and Turkey and Istanbul. And like, there's a guy in Scotland, I think that's logged on right now we haven't been able to connect with you guys. And now we're doing that. And it's like, it just went on that, like, here we go, new opportunity. Let's try to make lemonade or let's try to, what, let's, what's a tiki cocktail with lemon in it? <laughs> 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 but uh, a fog, make fog cutters when God gives you lemon. So yes, beach, beach bums own, we can, yeah. Beach, beach, bums, beach own. bums own. So that's kind of what we're doing here. So like part of me is just like on the inside. And then part of me is like, it's time to, to move forward and come together with people. And so anyhow, I don't want to get too all like into that stuff, well, but you know, one thing that I, I wanted to, you know, <laughs> with that in, in mind, because we're talking about, you know, getting into the, the, the weeds with the, uh, and they're beautiful weeds with the, yeah. uh, with the scoring and the arranging and stuff is that well, one of our folks listening uh, had the question was uh, new about Esquivel's a deep interest in electronics and in stereophonics uh -huh. and, and of course the great uh, story from latinesque where he had the the, the two rca studios yeah uh, one block uh, apart and had the guys connected by headphones and by closed circuit and is that do you now cleave i think would probably know the answer to this maybe i don't know if he might have ever discussed it with you when you were doing the Escabel album but did anybody has anybody gotten their hands on the master tapes, the multi-track masters? I mean, everybody's playing live, but there was no overdubs. But even so, if they're recording three track, let's say, you can get a little more. It's like when they did the pet sounds uh breakdowns and uh things were recorded on three track, but even on just three mm -hmm. tracks with everybody playing live, you could really kind of dig in and hear what the piano and organ and another piano were doing and things like that. So I wonder right. if that's anything that could be, uh, you know, that might be an interesting subject if somebody was able to get a hold of those master tapes. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have the transcriptions, we don't have the scores, but we do have the multi-tracks, hopefully, who knows? Yeah, they'd have to get digital because the, the practical nature of rewinding rapidly, like as you saw what I'm doing here, it just, I mean, it would take years probably to get through it. But, <laughs> but yeah, if they could be transferred to a digital medium so that you can rewind fast enough, you know, you would probably be able to get some, a little bit more out of them. But could you imagine, um, uh, could you imagine somebody doing a surround sound mix of, uh, 
Latin esque with <laughs> three track tapes, putting them up in Pro Tools and doing a surround. Yeah, that it would could. Be crazy. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the things about you know the the stereo file stuff. Um, I I know Esquivel was known for a lot of that, and and to me that on, on the surface it's like yeah he was exploiting the capabilities of the day, and it's kind of like oh Blu-ray, okay, let's make some Blu-ray content as opposed to like. I want to write this tune and it happens to need the capabilities of Blu-ray. It was a technology first kind of that. That's how I hear it. It sounds like let's do it. Let's use every button. You know, <laughs> I, I actually didn't want that. Uh, it, 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 I didn't want that to be the experience when people heard us play it because our recording, the unforgettable sounds of Esquivel, what are we going to do with it to make it unique? Cause basically I, First of all, I didn't even think people would want a, a recording of this because what is the point of recording someone else's arrangements of someone else's music that's already been recorded? It's like double derivative. <laughs> and so what are you going to bring that's new? And what we decided was we want to show people what it sounds like if you come to a concert and it's just live. It's, we actually had 60, I think we tracked 60 mics uh, going in the studio when we did this, not to get all the stereo stuff, but just to get the clarity of uh, the clarity of sound of all the instruments, but we didn't put in all the, the, the sweeps and the panning and all the different stuff, because I kind of wanted to capture that live sound for people uh, without, without some of that. Otherwise, we're just really just recreating exactly what's there already. So, and it shows off the athleticism of the musicians also. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Great. I mean, you know, when you get down to it, it's, it's not about how many tracks it was and it flying from speaker to speaker. It's just that right. it's all those people playing live in a room and making that sound. That's what's yeah. so amazing. And, and the, you know, the thing I remember, you know, leaning to the table next to me uh, at uh, Le Poisson Rouge uh, as the, uh -huh. the band was playing and just saying, you know, did you ever think you'd hear this live? I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it was like our favorite music. And yeah. it was, you know, the most fun you could have with your clothes on. It was just fantastic. Nice, nice. <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah, so anyhow, for, for now, I think big band, we're, we're really kind of focused on Esquivel. It's not out of the question we might, you know, throw someone else in. I've actually thought about, you know, if, if money was no object and, and it was easier to, to get out and get our music played more, I would write, I might write some original music that maybe sounded like that or actually like, once again, in the spirit of double derivatives, like I'm going to arrange a current pop tune the way Esquivel would arrange it, which I don't know what that says about my creativity or lack thereof, but like, like a Taylor Swift song, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> well, someone, some, one of our yeah. listeners asked that question, actually, uh -huh. that, that you could you and I, you know, I'm afraid I might have given, uh, you know, his his question short shrift because you had spoken about even uh -huh. though I'm transcribing the horn section, for instance, it doesn't mean that I can then arrange something the way Esquivel would arrange horns because I'm not a horn player and so forth. Yeah. But but it is that thing that that um, when the first Esquivel um, reissue album was released on uh, Bar None Records, uh, there. You know, Brother Cleve did that. He put together a little band with a few people from Combustible Edison and himself and me actually playing snare drum. And and he did things like Our Man Flint mm -hmm. in the in the mode of Esquivel. But of course he was doing the Vegas uh, Esquivel. He was doing right, that, the lounge you know, the seven of... piece, whatever, yeah. or eight piece. Mm -hmm. So it's very different than what you were doing, which is like right. the, you know, yeah. That's what was so amazing. I mean, yeah. because because you know, as you say, I mean where can you go to hear there wasn't anybody else doing that that's what yeah. made it so terrific you know? yeah, but yeah it's expensive and it's it's difficult unless you have uh you know people who are out there you know saying yes let's bring it in you know yeah yeah i mean the number one question i get is like well do you have a smaller version of it and i'm, I'm like <laughs> it, it's like do you want to just castrate it now it's like if you castrate it it's just not escavel it's just something else and it's it's like no over the top is the whole point like it's not about subtlety. I mean, there's actually subtlety in the music, but it's like, you can't take away that big sound. And actually my response is usually, it's already cut down because there were more brass, there were more trombones, there, there is some wind parts that are just not there. And we've, I've managed to kind of, I guess, fool everybody with like, it's close enough to sound really good live, but I, we're short. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're short some wins uh, and, uh, you know, but we've we've managed to really capture the essence of it, and 
And so anyhow, that's that. I don't know, did, any other questions or should I jump into the next part here? <clears throat> I don't know if Cristiano, uh, Cristiano, if you're there and you, anything comes up from uh, Facebook, feel free to jump, uh, jump in on the audio here and let me know. I'm, I'm not checking the uh, Facebook feed. So I'm going to kind of go through now the process of uh, Johnson Rag. Uh, and so this has been on my, I have like a rep list of like stuff I'd like to add. And, and typically what I do is, you know, every time we have a new concert coming up, I usually add one more tune to our library. And, and that's usually about all the time I have between getting the show ready and all this kind of stuff. Um, so this has kind of just been on the list. Uh, it's for some time. So I'm first, uh, I'm going to just kind of take you through the process here. Feel free to, to interrupt and, and let Dennis know if you have a question. Um, so I'm going to go back and share my screen here again. Um, let's see. Boom. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is listen and take notes. So if you feel like it, you can join me. Uh, what I'm going to do here is just, I just want to know who's playing in this, what instruments are playing. And I'm going to take notes and then I'm, I'm going to just have that as a kind of gauge about, all right, how many, and I have 22 players. So I have a pretty good idea. It's not like every single song has an entirely different orchestration. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of take some notes here and show you uh, what, what it's like. So, and I'm probably going to pause. Oh, the spinning. Okay, great. I love the spinning thing. So even right here, let's go back. So if you, I don't know if you can see my headphones, but because of the panning, sometimes I actually, I'm trying to see if there's two gueros. <laughs> so I actually think there's two gueros. So guiros are the, the fish you guys probably know from like you see in merengue music, they play, that's actually called wira. I don't know why it's feminine and, and merengue music and it's wiro and, and uh, Afro-Cuban music. But there's guiro, guiro one, guiro two. <laughs> All right, so right there is our mystery. And there's a, there's a quijada, which I don't know if I have one, but it's a jawbone of a donkey. Oh, I'll show it to you, it's pretty awesome, one second. Everybody needs one of these. <laughs> so this instrument's actually used a lot in, in Mexican uh, folk music and sewn music, but this is a, it's a jawbone of a donkey and it's called Quijada. And so if you listen, you can hear this actually, he, and he does use this a fair amount. We've actually, one of them exploded at our CD release party. It was pretty, pretty awesome. There it is. So it's on beat three, one. So it's on beat three on the third bar. Two, two, three. right here. One, two, ah, get, get, get. one, two. There's the recording. There's is ringing a lot longer. Mine is short. So anyhow, so there's Quijada in there. Okay, and there's a chach. That's a cowbell. Technically, that's a. Baby, you okay? Whoops! Someone's uh, not on mute. If you could just mute, that would be great. All right, so. So we got lots of percussion here. So that shaker, that ch -ch 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 -ch, that's a shaker, and it's, I like to use kashishi, which it probably was not. Kashishi is a Brazilian basket shaker, which has a nice tick, tick, tick kind of sound. These are probably maracas, but no one will get mad. The Brazilians in the house will appreciate the fact I'm using kashishi. Oh, there's a, oh, you hear the bongo? So it's on beat four. Two, three. One, two. Do you hear the little roll? It's the wing. Wow, that almost sounds like sticks. So there's a high bongo 
Okay. This is kind of what it's like. I mean, I know there's bass coming up. I think there's another percussion in here. Let's see. Right. Get everything. So, like, one thing I'm thinking about right now. I'm listening this way right now. I'm 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 scanning in my head the highest frequency stuff, like high stuff versus low stuff. I'm listening, trying to listen in to a a range of pitch and trying to visualize what am I hearing in that range. So I'm just not paying attention to the other stuff that's going on. And that's like like at first I didn't catch the the shaker there. I didn't catch the bongo because I was so focused on the stereo guiros. <laughs> Who, who what's that's like the coolest thing I heard tonight. So stereo guiros, that could be a song. So let's keep going. There's the bass. So this is nice. It's in C major, nice, easy, nice key, which is good. Guess what? Steel guitar. Steel guitar. All right. Oops, get back to the steel guitar. Big brass. Uh, so, like here, I'm just gonna. Let's add a notes column. Notes. Notes. When brass comes in, there is a little ding ding. Why did I write that? So I'll, I'll let you hear the ding ding. Okay. Right here. Da 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 da. The, the cowboy's just playing that. Dun, 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 dun. Why did I write it down right now? Because at some point I'm going to listen to that brass thing a thousand times, and it's just like the the cowbell would just be lost in the number of times I've listened to the other parts. So sometimes this fresh this fresh perspective, it's like now's the time to capture these details, so I can kind of come back and just check off the boxes. Like, okay, don't forget the little cowbell thing. Because remember, music makers, no cowbell. Like, we actually went live without cowbell. So anyhow, so that's that's that. <laughs> Okay, so there's some harp. So they're using harmony music. Is there organ in there? So right now I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and I I, I think there might be low rumbly organ. So what I'm gonna do is jack up my low end here, just so we can hear, hear what's going on down in the low end. So listen to how different it sounds with the EQ like this. The brass is gonna come down in volume big time. It's gonna be very boomy. Oh, timbales, did you hear it? Bonk, bonk. So there's timbales there. I might even just finish the tune with, let's go back a second. I might go back through it now and I'm just gonna listen to this low end. It's nice, it's really mushy sounding, but it's helping me just hear who's, who's in the low end here. Bass trombone, acoustic bass, again, just so I can see if there's any surprises. So actually the timbales playing Cascara at 57. Cascara is the shell of the timbales. I think he's just playing like a standard. So, so. so if you hear it, the 
la la da 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 dum and then another part's going da 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 na na so a lot of this like crossing where one line's going up another one's coming down very escavel kind of vibe uh for that so who's going up so if i can get this bass trombone sound i think there's a sax here I think Second. so right in this I'm listening to the da 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 that low thing it's not just the bass there's a there's a zzz kind of sound which is a reed instrument. So there's probably a Barry sax that's also playing that. I'm just trying to see if I can isolate it. Yeah. Okay. So when it goes dun 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 listen to that part in the low end, you're gonna hear you're gonna hear what to me sounds like Barry sax. John, 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 did you hear it? Gong, gong, right there. So there's at least, oops, stop. Okay, so there's at least sax, baritone there. So if someone is asking about like the cliche piano thing, so yeah, there there's like some very, very cliche uh, Esquivel things here. Uh, so let's. This is just D and G chords here. Yeah, so he's doing this Esquivel thing. See. Yeah, so this chuck it a chuck it a chuck it a chuck it a chuck cone, chuck it a chuck it a chuck it a chuck it a chuck cone, chuck it a chuck it a chuck it a chuck. He he really plays very percussive style piano, which which I totally did because I'm a percussionist, so he's doing his I'll do it slow. That's what it sounds like to me. Might be another chord in a second. Oh. oh, yeah. So, so his left hand's changing. What I'm trying to get right now is what is his left hand doing? So let's turn the EQ back on and see if we can grab some of that. Hey, I'm going to pause here for a second. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, we haven't written any music yet. Uh, are there any, any questions as we go through this? But like this part, even just alone, is is quite fun. I, I enjoy just simply even figuring out at a macro level what's going on. It's super fun. And, and then sometimes I'll do this. I'll just like, I really want to dig into the piano part. So I'm just going to go back to the score and now start writing piano parts. And then maybe I'll come back and finish it. I don't really go through it methodically. Part of it's just because it's fun. Like if I hear something that sounds fun, I might want to just work on that for a while. You might we did have a my... question. We did have a question from uh, Brian sure. Lewis. Who, uh, okay. well, Brian? Do you want to put it to uh, to Mr. Howe? You can unmute and ask the question. Sure. Sure. Hey. Uh, What's up, Brian? First of all, thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, can you hear me? Okay. 
I can. I have you pinned. You're okay. huge on my screen. Oh, okay, cool. Um, thank you so much for doing this. It's amazing. I've been into Esquivel for since like 07. But um, one thing I was thinking is for like deconstructing the parts like you're doing just now, uh, have you ever considered taking the the track into like a DAW, like Pro Tools or Cubase, and adding like a uh, like a filter of some sort, like band pass, low pass, high pass, just something to help like zero in? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm sure even since I started doing this, there's, you know, the technology has gotten crazy good. I mean, there's, uh, I actually just talked to the CEO of a company called PEX, uh, which does, uh, they use artificial intelligence and they basically scan all the user generated content, videos and audio on the web. And they identify master recording and song usage there and their model can go and detect that. So could it do this? Yeah, there's probably stuff that can even go and do some of the transcription. I, I, I'd be surprised to find one that could actually do quite the detail that I'm doing on, on these. We had a question about that actually earlier. Someone who was asking about using AI to do transcriptions. But yeah, that's a, it's a, be a heavy lift. One would give them a, a run for their money, I think. Yeah, it, it's actually a really challenging thing because the um, you first would have to teach you'd have to teach an AI what, what the difference between a trombone and a trumpet and a guiro is, because it's just gonna be listening to a stereo audio track, which is just a WAV file. It's, all, it's not like MIDI, where each, you know, each line here is computer code. There's a tenor saxophone that's in MIDI. That, that's actually a lot of information right there. So I think it's gonna be a long time before you can just uh, teach an AI how to do transcription, because you would also need a lot of copies of like, training information like here's a correct score and here's a correct musical audio and you need to feed it a ton of those before it could then learn how to do it so i think we're a ways from from that which i'm kind of glad about it keeps the transcriber i mean i don't know who need no one needs transcriptions i don't know there's probably a business for transcribing but um so what uh, the original question though oh you would ask about pro tools and 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 daws and that I wasn't really in a hurry with this project, Brian. It's like, this is just something that's fun. I, I enjoy doing this process. And as much as it's like a lot of cognitive load and brain time, it's like meditation for me. Like, I mean, just doing this right now, I haven't done this. It's been years since I've really like opened up a, a tune and done this before. And it's just, it's kind of just, I spent hours on this. I mean, just six hours, I would sit here. It's like video games for some, I'm not a gamer, but like they can just suck you in. And I would just spend hours and hours and I had a lot more time back then, uh, you know, to do it. But it's just like meditation. It's, it's really kind of something I, I enjoy doing. It's not a, it's not tax for me. It's not like workout. It's not like going to the gym or something. I don't know. It's like, it's just fun. I, I so I don't want to cheat. Like I, I did, you know, there, there's one section uh, I'll show you, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you uh, the worst, uh, uh, the worst of the worst uh, in terms of the hardest the hardest thing in the entire collection of music we have, and this is actually why it's not on the album we did, is that I wasn't satisfied with our transcription of it. And this is Harlem Nocturne. It has a crazy, this part's all nice and easy. So, I should just play, well, I'll let it play a little bit. Let me turn off the EQ. Dennis, can you hear the music? All good? Just thumbs up, good. Okay. I really wanted to record this too, but... Okay, here it comes. One, two, here. I've probably listened to that thing like... 800 times this little slice of music here. It's just. And it does it again later on. And it's, it's crazy. So I'll show you. So it was the brass parts that are really difficult here. So I spent a lot of time making my EQ look like this. Can, can you imagine how Juan must have driven the engineers crazy? Like, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I hear enough of the third trumpet on that. Right, right. 
Yeah, uh, it's so this is gonna sound really shrill. Um, I'm sorry if it's so. So, like for example, in the very high. Sorry if your ears are bleeding. So there's at least two trumpets up there. There's a xylophone playing, and I think it was Genny the in, in the quintet. Kenny plays the bass, uh, all the flute, the major flute solos as well, the bass flute, alto flute, C flute. There's piccolo here as well, I think. Which I don't think there's any other piccolo, but he seemed to think there's piccolo. At that register, it's just really freaking hard. And our thing just kind of sounded like, it's like we had this great concert and it sounds real. And it's like inside, I'm just like, uh, uh, when this part would come up, I'm just kind of like, okay, it's only two seconds. Okay, we're done and keep conducting. <laughs> Cause that was just embarrassing. Cause it, it's, and it, the bad thing, like for the musicians, it sounds like they don't know what they're doing and they're playing it wrong and they're just playing what I wrote down. Um, and so why am I telling you all this to get back to Brian's thing about digital tools? Um, I finally sent this to another Brian, Brian Davis, who's uh, our, our, our lead trumpet player down in New York. Um, he plays with a bunch of the New York city big bands and, uh, wonderful British guy. And, uh, and he took this and, and worked on it. Uh, I think he, he pulled it into a, a tool and slowed it way down so that you could just hold, hold these chords. And then he, he sketched out what he thought the orchestration was and sent it back. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm totally sold. It's, it's accurate, but it's, it's, much closer than what my thing was. I still think there's some something wrong with it, but at some point I just I just gave up on it. And and here it, I'll show you again. It does it again, slightly differently towards the end. Right there. Right here. This is a little bit easier because there's just less stuff, but it kind of does that lick twice in the tune. So. Those things always make me cringe, especially it's like the whole tune is fine, it's accurate, and then you come to something like that and it's like, ugh, like do I really want to put that on stage? Because it just makes the band sound like they're not playing well and it's not their fault, you know? It's, it's you know, but that's, that's just part of what this project's like is it's leaving and we try to make it better each time we do it. And so now it's passable. I don't quite, I don't quite cringe as much when, when uh, Harlem Nocturne <laughs> comes up and, and, uh, and not to mention people love Yolanda's solo. Yolanda sings the, the soprano part on that. She does a great job sounding very kind of vintagey, just like the recording. And um, so yeah, so that's, that's my answer on the tech. Um, should I jump back? Uh, were there any other questions at this point? I know we're also way over here. So, you know, if, uh, I'll probably go a little bit later. Maybe I'll like work on one part. You guys are welcome to stick around. I'm actually kind of having fun. So I might just hang here and do a little bit more of this, but um, maybe I'll, I'll just make a couple uh, other annou uh, announcements here. Um, so we're trying to do this series. And, and so if you're not on my mailing list, uh, please join it at orchestratica.com. Um, you can go to um, um, actually just go to remotelymusic.com and that'll send you to the right place. Uh, you can get on our list and then you'll know, <clears throat> you'll know about when we're doing more remotely music sessions. Um, the next one is going to be May 15th uh, at 9 p.m. And that's going to be the quintet. Again, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do yet because we're still kind of figuring that out too. Um, but it's been nice. I've been throwing polls out to the mailing list. It's been great getting your feedback uh, on that. And it really did. We had a meeting and we talked, talked it through and like, like we looked at polls and charts. It's like people are saying they want Eskimo. <laughs> you know, it was, I was shocked that this was like the number, like it was a, kind of a close tie on, on the quintet. Like let the guys play whatever they want and do an Eskimo nerd out transcription thing. So, um, so that feedback's great. So um, you can help us kind of figure out uh, what, what we should work on together. And, and I want this to be interactive like it is. So um, that's kind of the ad. And then finally, if you'd like to support this, uh, there's a there's a link. It's just bit.ly bitly link slash support dash RMS. Um, or you can just go to the remote, remotelymusic.com and you'll, you'll find a little link there to uh, support us if you want. So we, you know, if you can send in a little cash, that's great. It's not necessary. Um, it, worst case, it, it just I, I would rather just have you as a fan and come on our list and, and join join us as we kind of figure this out. Uh, it, you don't have to spend money right now because I know a lot of people are are hurting for work uh, right now and it's a tough time. So it's, it's, 
it's nice to just come together right now. And that, that's really the, the first pri priority. So, um, so that's that part of it. Um, so I'm going to jump back uh, just a little, I'm going to keep going down my list here. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll do like another 15 minutes or something like that, take some more questions, and then call it a night, and we'll see you on the other side. So I'm going to jump back to my Johnson rag. It's funny how Herbie Hancock comes up there. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's go back to somewhere around here. Yeah. What's going on here? Another mystery. There is hand claps or something. So check this out with the timbali. I'm gonna, it's gonna get really shrill for a second, I'm sorry. I don't know if you can hear it, but when the, the timbali is playing dun, 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 and there's like, there's yeah. another, there's a clap or a, it, it may be, a, uh, it may be Irish spoons. It may be, <laughs> it may be spoons actually. So in, in Celtic music. So I, <laughs> I have some nice spoons actually, the Canadian kind. Uh, and actually, so this is, this is also something we do that's different than recording. So in a recording studio, you can get up close mic and, and you can record the, the clap sound and it would cut through a big band. On a live stage, especially at a big stage, no one's gonna hear that. So we might substitute, like in that case, uh, uh, the, the um, Irish uh, spoons, uh, wooden spoons there to, to capture that sound. It sounds close enough to a hand clap, but it would actually be heard a little bit more. So I'm just gonna put down spoons. That was one of the things in uh, some of those recordings that he did, Brian, that always amazed me. For instance, one of my very favorites is Anna, uh, uh -huh. where the orchestra is screaming full tilt, comes to a stop, and he goes to a two-bar thing of flamenco guitar played very softly. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Insane. Yes. I mean, you know, the, the, again, the engineering, you know. Uh, right. The, and, 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 of course, the great compressor limiters and stuff but uh, how are you going to do that live i mean it's just uh, you know right right yeah i mean that we played the montreal jazz festival and and you know one of the they wanted to do it outside and i'm always much more of a fan of presenting this concert inside with very good sound support because there's so much detail in the music it's it's closer to like listening to an orchestral symphony the, the uh, dynamic range is very wide um, and there's a lot of stuff that's not in a typical like festival band or whatever. So you're not going to hear like that flamenco guitar. It's like, you know, there's 50,000 people outside, you know, Montreal Jazz Festival and there's this like flamenco, you know, very soft guitar. It just, it doesn't always translate as well in a loud environment. I, I really like to do this in a quiet, more concert environment uh, where people can hear these radical changes in texture and volume and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, outside's fun, but but it does, we do lose some of the detail that I think is is just in the nature of his music. And it's so extreme, like, eh, that, but that's that's the character, right? You know, it's, it's such a big part of it. So, um, but let's, let's, just, let's see if there's anything else I missed here. I'm sorry if this, your ears are bleeding. Let me see if I can turn this down. God, that's really shrill. Oh, and there were some saxophones there. Did you hear those? And there was another horn there. Let's see. So, I mean, I knew there's saxes in there already, but. Um, so, 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 I'm 
up at the front. Whoa, there's... And there's like a xylophone way up there too, so... So there's a fall that and I can't tell the xylophone's kind of falling with it or it's just the trumpet. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it's just Yeah, I think it's just the just the uh, uh trumpets doing that. So now I have a sketch, you know, there's there's you know, we have three trumpets. Um so we're just, that's just what we're going to do. There's I'm sure there's trombone in there. I didn't really hear it. I think there's a horn uh, in there as well. So once I have this, then I would head over to finale. I'm going to go back to finale here and uh, open up. So prior to this, I made a, I just made a blank score here and I took a guess of what was going to be in this from what I had done before, partly so you don't have to sit here watching me draw blanks staffs on the page. So um, I took a guess, uh, you know, there's probably two altos, two tenors, Barry, there's three trumpets. Um, there's electric guitar. This, this really isn't electric guitar. It's, it's a slide guitar. So I would put a slide guitar here. Actually, did, was there a slide guitar? Yeah, there was, there was slide guitar in this. Uh, there was piano, there was bass, drum set. There was a ton of percussion. Um, there was not organ. I'm going to get rid of the organ because I don't think that was actually in here. So, oh, timpani. Let's see if there's timpani. I did not hear any timpani. Did anybody hear the timpani? Raise your hand if you heard timpani. Let's turn down the treble. Your ears will thank you. Uh, yes, your ears will thank you. Now it's gonna sound like a dog. So I'm just gonna, ooh. Do you hear this noise floors? Oh, there's nothing here. Space. I'm trying to see if there's any low end timpani in some of these brass parts just to make sure. I don't think there was. he's doing this this flat six chord and then this maybe a seventh chord it's like well how many saxes are there 
you know, I was just sit and listen to that over and over, map out the parts, you know, and that's, that's basically how, how it goes. Um, so I'll do a little of the bass track just because I can do the bass track uh, uh, rather quickly. It's the bass part's usually almost the easiest thing. So often I start with that because it also helps me know where I am in the tune. So, so I'm going to jack. Always upright, right? Is it always upright there? Yes, yeah, unless you get into the 60s stuff. I think Yayo and some of those tunes maybe had electric on them. So there's. Okay, so I'm actually going to use what's called speedy note entry here. And I wrote that in earlier because I'm like, I know it starts with that. So don't think on. Uh, so. Uh, and I have this in my head already, so. So let's see what that sounds like. Uh, and actually this is already wrong because it's in the wrong spot. There's four bars of percussion. At least four, if not more. Let's see, how many bars are there? Three, four, two, two, three, four, three, four, five, six, and four, seven, eight, eight. Oh, six bars. Another weirdness. A lot of times these things are four bars or eight bars. Is this really six? Okay. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, 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 four, six, bass. Wow. Okay, that's weird. Maybe they edited it out. <laughs> so I already, this is already wrong too, because the bass player here would play don ding gong. Ding ging gong ging gong. Ging ging gong ging gong. Ging ging gong ging gong. This little this is a rest here, this little squiggly thing. And what he actually wrote, he didn't write um, rest. Rest. He wrote that note is held down there. So it's stuff like this where like you know, like a lot of times, sometimes they won't even, the guys won't tell me or the girls won't, the, the gals in the band won't even tell me that sometimes they, they do mark it and they'll send it back and just say the articulation's wrong or, you know, this kind of stuff. So I would actually come in here, add a tie. Don't, don't, don't get, uh, don't get gone. Yeah, so now it's, now it would play it right. You want to hear what it sounds like? It's going to be so, well, let's just fix all of it. So this guy, since it's a pattern, just paste this bad boy and let's fix this one. No, I don't want that. And this one, don't get gong. Don't get gong. So tie and dang. And I know this is like probably watching paint dry for some regular people, not us though. Um, uh, did I write that right? Dun, dun, dun. No, I didn't. This is dun. Yeah, there it is. Uh, 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 dun, dun. Yep. Uh, and then I'm just going to copy and paste this. And that's, oops. Oh, gosh. Okay. Oops, it playing past it. Okay. You're not going to hear anything yet. Let's start it at bar seven. Well, Play from leftmost measure. Okay, so let's scroll over to this bad boy. You can hear this amazing bass line. You heard it here first. Oh, and it's way too slow. Let's speed it up. Let's try. It's about 130, maybe something like that. 130 BPM. So, how did I do? I got A plus. <laughs> Anyhow, this is like, this is what it is. And you just fill in the grid, you know, it's like em it. it's empty, nice. <laughs> empty pages of stuff. And like, yeah, and it gets crazy. I mean, I'll, maybe I'll do, I'll do a little of the slide guitar and maybe we'll, we'll end with that since everyone loves a slide guitar. Let's see, let's see if I can find it. a D chord, but 
Something's not right. It's not diminished, uh, but there's definitely Howard sixth chord. What's that? Howard Levitsky is telling us, uh, saying it's a sixth. Yeah, but there's yeah. Anyhow. This is what it's like. I mean, we, we could sit here all night and, and decode all this, but it takes quite a while to fill in in, in the grid. Uh, and my my brain's a little shot already. And <laughs> at this point, so um, yeah, this is this is. A, I'm gonna. Any other questions I can answer? Um, you know, I'm. If anyone's curious to, to hear one little part done here, I could sit here and work on that, or you know, we can call it. And I, I think I think maybe it's a good time to call it uh, here at this point, uh, unless anyone has any other questions. Uh, but this was uh, super fun for, for me to get to share, um, share all this like inside look at the Esquivel stuff. And uh, been, if you want- It's been really great. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see any uh, more questions other than that there was a, uh, a comment made by someone <clears throat> uh, saying that, uh, boy, it would be great when we can get to the time where perhaps, uh, we can get the quartet in, a, in the room together and do one of these just with the quartet playing live. And we'll, instead of it being the Paul Mall of hour, it will be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, Mr. Ho, you know, yeah, we're going to try to do, uh, we do want to try to do something, uh, live, uh, without click. Um, it's, it's probably going to be some kind of, um, uh, very open, uh, a very open thing that's not particularly rhythmic. So it may be a nice, like, I don't know, meditation kind of vibe or something like that. Uh, we'll probably have um, a lot of improvisation in it as well. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna try to just see what happens where we're not all actually gonna be hearing each other. At, you know, we're all hearing delays, right? We're gonna hear our, our peers coming in late, which means it's like this daisy chain. I hear it late. I react late. The next person hears my change late. And you can just see how it, it all bounces off each other. But that could be something worth, you know, trying. Other musicians have tried this too. It's not like we're the only ones trying it. So, but we're just, that's the kind of things we want to try on these series. Uh, yeah, someone so, was saying, someone is saying, Howard Levitsky is saying that he just saw the New York Philharmonic players uh, doing a Mahler piano quartet from isolation all lined up. And and I've seen a little bit of that too with some of these house concerts with people with you know big budgets who <laughs> yeah who, who can do I don't know do they do it to a click somehow or how does that do they somehow build in the latency but I think the previous thing about the quartet was that just when we can all be together again that it would yeah. be cool to to you know when you four folks can get in a room or the five of you can get in a room. Um, to yeah. do a live concert, uh, a web, a web concert. Oh yeah, yeah. We've we actually did. Uh, I did one like in 2005 when I was in Waitiki. We actually did a webcast. That that was pretty insane. It, it was super shaky and it wasn't high quality. But we we were playing around with that a long time ago. So, but yeah, we would definitely consider doing that uh, uh, go, going forward. Um, it, it's gotten easier to do those kinds of things. So um, that's definitely definitely something that we could try. So. 
Um, but, but this uh, has been amazing. You know, this has been really cool. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. and he's right. It was a six chord, and yeah, I felt like okay, I'm I'm like I'm I'm crashing and burning here. I can't even get the first steel note parts on. But <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's it, yeah, it it's, it's, it's a lot of brain space. Task. It takes it's a lot an of Olympian task, and uh, yeah, and it, it gives us all an appreciation of what what it took to make yeah uh, cd and to mount those live shows and uh, everybody here and and many many more people uh loved every minute of it so uh, hats yeah off to you, brian because it was really 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 great and this is yeah great. we're gonna just on the for the escavel I, I know like a lot of our fans are you know came to us through the 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 escavel mega band uh and 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 that's more their their interest than, than the quintet and then we have some people that are more like the the global jazz quintet um but on the escavel note um i'm talking to my friend arturo uh there there was a documentary uh film that was in the works uh and and my my buddy arturo from mexico has hours and hours of footage he he traveled all over the place interviewing everyone that knew any, anything and just downloading their brains basically onto tape um the, the uh he has very ambitious plans for for the film and and when you start getting into the rights and stuff it gets really crazy with the rights management because a lot of these these are very famous jazz and dance band tunes it's expensive to license so uh, you know, he's facing the same challenge with just like funding a project, a very esoteric documentary project like this. Um, but I, I talked to him about maybe getting some of the footage and kind of doing a watch party uh, and, and maybe getting uh, Cleve to come on and just chatting, uh, just having a little roundtable kind of hosted uh, podcast kind of style discussion together uh, about that project and, and some of their insights uh, from just I think he probably knows more now about Esquivel than anyone because he's talked to so many people and, and like with a historian perspective. Um, so it'd be great to try to, I'm going to try to get him on the show and, uh, and, and turn this into another episode of remotely music. Yeah. So yeah, that'd be great. Um, so, yeah. So at any rate, just to close out here, um, I think we got to all the questions and, and uh, please uh, go to remotely music.com and join the mailing list there. If you, again, if you want to support us, the, the bitly link was up there. Uh, it's just a uh, bitly. Uh, you, you can just go to remotelymusic.com. You'll you'll see the the link to donate there right at the top. Uh, if you'd like to 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 see more of these events. So, um, but this has been super fun, and I'm I'm flattered you guys cared to to actually look at this stuff because I didn't think most people, like especially non musicians, would find this particularly interesting. So, um, it, it's it's really nice to share all this with you guys. So, um, so yeah. So I think I'm I'm just I'm gonna sign off at this point and, and i wanted to thank uh dennis kelly here for, uh down in cranston new jersey uh tiki deeks tiki lounge uh, for hosting the show and uh all the tiki ohana okay i'm gonna do this crazy thing i'm gonna unmute and everyone's gonna clap now for dennis ready one two three unmuting everybody <laughs> go ahead and clap and back to back to brian brian amazing job sir and we all raise our glasses to you empty though they may be we're going to refill them everybody line up at the bar at tiki deep let's go That's I'm right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice um get a complimentary esquivel swizzle <laughs> yep oh sorry dennis i killed you sorry yeah yeah i love your squizzles but um yeah thank you again and uh stay tuned uh be on the mailing list and and we'll be in touch when we do this again so uh if you guys have questions uh facebook you can do just brian at orchestratica.com shoot me a note if you guys like what you heard any feedback you want to send us about future things we might try experiments stuff like that if you're willing to show up and and listen we're willing to try stuff and just react to coronavirus that's really what remotely music is about it's just trying to react to this in a positive way and I don't know about you, like I completely forgot about COVID-19 and all that stuff. And that was the point of this was just to escape from the news cycle and like get into this little tiny crevice and, and, and just nerd out together. So um, that's, that's the point here. So, right, so, so I'm, I'm unmuting everybody and let's have a round for Brian, please. Because this oh, thank, is you. Really awesome. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you again. And, 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 and be safe, uh, be safe out there and, uh, and, and, and thank all the, the essential workers out there that are doing some, some really crazy work for us from the delivery drivers to, uh, you know, medical people, stuff like that. Um, they're really putting their lives on the line for us. So, so please thank them and, and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. See you later. Aloha.